Uh, first speaker um, for this session is Dr. Um, Susanna Schmidt. Um, Susanna is a uh, principal geologist and group leader in um, CSIRO. Uh, she's been there for 20 years and um, well, she's got 20 years experience in <laughs> mineral exploration, um, the mining industry and the government. Uh, she's worked in greenfields exploration in Greenland, Africa and Australia with a focus on sediment hosted mineral systems, but with a real focus on the adaptation of um, petroleum exploration techniques to, to mineral exploration. So she's gonna be speaking to us today about um, uh, from macro to micro scale updates on the uh, sedimentary copper mineral systems of the Stuart Shelf. So please make her welcome. Hello everyone. Um, yeah, so my talk is around the macro to micro scale of all of the research we've done in collaboration with the Geological Survey of uh, South Australia. Uh, and it's just a lot of things, it's just snapshots. So if you have any questions, you can come to us or to me afterwards. And there's a lot of people that uh, contributed to that. It's um, a, a true 50-50 collaboration between the survey and CSIRO. So yeah, so what have we done in, in the project or what do we have? So we have a lot of data collection, which was mainly carried out by Carmen and Adrian and the team. And then we look at the basin architecture. So we look at different geophysical methods and figuring out if we can map the basin, uh, basement contact and so on. Uh, a lot of sedimentology, again, uh, most of the work or all of the work has been carried out by Jesus A. And then um, we do a bit more around the basin evolution using various techniques. So the Stuart Shelf, most of you here in South Australia know where it is. It sits on top of the Gola Craton, so I'll just have a bit of a picture. It's the faint black outline, but I, I thought I'd put on the, uh, the known ICG deposits as a comparison, but then you got the uh, Stuart Shelf Mine Gunson deposit, which is probably the best known one in that area. And as you already see, the main challenge in this region is that the geophysical data, particularly the magnetics and gravity, is often um, showing basement and doesn't really give any details on the, the basin fill. The basin's only about 1,000 meters deep at maximum depth. So we had to come up with more uh, innovative ways of figuring out to use ge geophysics in, in a, to get a better understanding of the basin. The advantage is that we have a lot of trill holes, and I mean a lot. For a basin, it's usually you have a 10. Here we have hundreds, and that's because everyone drills through the basin to get to the Gorlock Rayton, and we made use out of that. So uh, as I just said, um, we kind of approached the geophysics after a few uh, mis mistrials in the beginning from a top-down, bottom-up approach. So that's the Stuart Shelf stratigraphy. So you know it's the neoprotozoic uh, strata, mainly between the two glacial cycles. And then underneath, you got the uh, Goller, Goller rocks plus the Pandora formation, which is a much older basin. The problem with the bottom is that the Pandora formation is mainly a sandstone, so um, it's not much deformed either, and it doesn't necessarily give you a magnetic signature too. So you end up with having uh, two different basement depth, and we kind of model that. So the gray one here is uh, the depth to the real basin, basement, um, but the Pandora formation sits on top. So one thing we have, you know, the Gärtner dikes. There are heaps of them. They're very dominant in the magnetics, so we map them uh, semi-automatically, automatically, the, the depth of the dikes, because the theory, the theory is the dikes are uh, around 18, 30 million years old. The Stuart Shelf sequence is um, much younger, so we know the top of the, if the dikes made it all to the surface, this would be your maximum depth of the basin. So we used, make the use out of that, assuming that our basin surfaces that we try to create can never intersect one of the measured, uh, calculated types of dikes. And then, of course, we try to get the gravity a bit uh, reprocessed towards mapping the uh, Pandora formation. And then from the top, I'm going to show you a bit more detail around the, e the different, trying different inversion types on EEM data. And then also we had, uh, was presented last year in a talk using MT data to map the basement. The, uh, Going into more detail, so that's 
just quick. Uh, the new gravity in this area showing up basically that what it should show is that um, the higher gravity is where you have Pandora closer to the surface. But it's, we're still working on it to see if that, if that uh, fits because the Pandora is quite variable in density as well. And then if you go to the EM, so this is this line going through here, zooming in further. Uh, it's just switched, swapped it, like rotated by 90 degrees. So you got a couple of salt lakes. Of course, it's always an issue with EM. Uh, that's one of the long tempest lines that uh, GA did a few years ago. Then the new gravity. And th so just to note that those structures are new, not newly interpreted yet. Those are the structures that you will find from the SARIC uh, data set. And then this is the original processed um, tempest data. So that whole stretch is about 80 kilometers. And that's the inversion we tried on just to pick up the, the subtleties a bit better and the, the breaks. And it very faintly, you see the, the drill holes put onto it. So for example, all of these uh, darkish red columns is Pandora. So the Pandora is actually quite shallow in this area here. Uh, there too, but then we got the Salt Lake, so that gives an issue. So it's a bit of, um, a bit of geofantasy involved to get meaning into that. And um, it's all work in progress. So it works in some areas quite well, and then in some areas it doesn't make much sense. Um, so, but if I take that and then just even just plot these uh, pre-interpreted structures on it, you see that the majority of those structures that are in the in the in the Saric map, they're actually coinciding where we have those massive breaks in the basin, and they make sense because if you down here in the interpreted section. All I did is I just connected to where we have drill hole data and extended it towards where we have these proposed uh, break. And you see it kind of makes sense. We know we have the Pandora going up here. Here is a bit further down. We've got the Tepler Hill in there. So it's very likely you have some sort of um, step there, which is likely a bit of a graben structure or a horse structure. And then you go even further. And once you get over that edge here, so Mount Gunson is just below down here, you're getting into much more deeper units. and um, you know, you're filling it up with, with idiocarin units. So, so you would think, and then in some areas here, we got more detail and the core, the depth to the Pandora actually matches the, the EM really well. So the EM wasn't modeled against any of the stratigraphic units. So you see there is a bit of, um, you could see there are uh, potential use of the EM when processed in, in a certain way. Um, and it do inform you about um, the, the variations in conductivity. One thing I should know that I can't go into it, but we already know that the density in the, in the Pandora formation is uh, very different in, across the basin because there has been a massive leaching zone in there. So that could contribute to uh, having that variation in the in EM signal um, when you want to try to map, use that for the top of the Pandora formation. Okay, moving on. So we're moving, we're going from the large scale, now I'm zooming in into more drill core and then further. So this was uh, similar things like this uh, slide was presented by Carmen, I think last year, and we had the workshop around it. So it's basically, um, oops, sorry, back. It's basically um, locking the core, is, is getting gamma ray data, lithophases and then phases associations, and getting beautiful images and then creating a deposition environment model. So. Um, the very good thing, and I don't think I've ever seen it anywhere else in the world, is that the different fuzzies association actually match the formation boundaries. So we can take that information wherever we ha don't have a locked core, but we have someone mapped the stratigraphy, we can actually use the stratigraphy as a, as a boundary for a sequence stratigraphic framework. This is very, it's a very rare thing. So we take that information of the 25 drill holes locked, and Again, that's work in progress and create a um, sequence stratigraphic cross section in, across the entire Stuart shelf. And we, we hang it up onto maximum flooding surfaces. So that's a point in time where the whole region was, was flooded by one event. So it means that you didn't have any mountains or anything if you have that, that, that base, and it's in the base of the Tepley Hill in there. So, and you see in here, so the green is the Tepley Hill basically. Um, at that point in time, you had two paleo, paleo valleys. 
with, filled with pilatilite, so that's stirred in glaciation. And then uh, with time, you slowly had these two paleo valleys filling up with the Tepley Hill formation. And then once you get to the next glacial cycle on the base of the, with the Nacalina formation, cap carbonate, um, we had the same paleo valleys then filled with Viola sandstone glacials. The Mount Gunson area here, where you got uh, Mount Gunson deposits, it's been at that point, you see already here, it's been a, a, a rigid block that didn't move, so there are ba two basins on each side subsided. So we can tell from just looking at the core in the correlation between that, we can tell a story that uh, we had the developing um, deepening basins on, on each side of the Paleo High, which, you know, it's great to know because there's very likely to be a structurally con controlled, um, oh, um, you know, process. Then looking further, we then, again, that's sort of work in progress and it builds onto the surfaces that uh, GSSA already published, adding a few more. We then take the information and use that to build our um, surface across the, across the Stuart shelf, which then should help, you know, as a package to get it out at Jesus, at Zarek to for explorers to know if they want to target one particular horizon. But it also tells us about the basin evolution. And again, here you see it's, the angle is slightly different, but you see here, this is one, one of those paleo valleys, and then you've got the other one with sort of that ridge in between. Um, hopefully we're gonna get the, the surfaces done quite soon. Um, and then also include the base Cambrian unconformity and also the, the base Permian unconformity. So we kind of get, and then uh, potentially the tertiary as well. So you get like all of the major unconformities that were part of uh, you know, the, the various orogenies in the regions or the, the glaciations. So that helps to predict your, your preferred drilling depth to target across the entire area. One other thing we do to understand the basin evolution a bit more is we look at the uh, subsidence rate on each drill hole we, we locked. And that's based, it's a very typical petroleum approach where you basically reconstruct based on the thickness of the current thickness here, reconstruct the, uh, the porosity and, and permeability loss through time backwards. That where you, in the end of the day, you see that, you know, you got the, the thickness of the Tepley Hill up to a point where we know there has been a regression cycle, so it's been a shallowing of the water column, and then we've got the uh, the, perm, uh, the, the Marino and glaciation so eroding a lot of things, and then after that, so that's just the time window for the cryogenian and Etia here, and then you get the uh, or Etia Karn, you get the deposition of the younger units. So we're extending that and also then including what happened after like the uplift during the Delamarian and um, later on. It's a bit tricky because there's a lot of unconformities and we have to estimate how much has been lost. One of the things we use for that are also carbon isotopes, which I don't have time to present on, but so we kind of estimate, um, you know, the, the thickness is related to deposition versus the thickness has been taken off. And then the next step is then also look on other ways of, of mapping the different facies associations across the basin and the variations in mineralogy. For that, we use the, the extensive data sets on the high logger data, uh, slightly reprocess them. Uh, but what you also see, already see in those couple of example holes, they're quite unique depending where you are stratigraphically. So, you know, the Tregolana shale is compositionally very different. So, those are mostly micas and um, feldspars. And, and clays, while it's Tepley Hill formation is dominated by chloride and carbonate, and of course silica. So you kind of already have very sharp boundaries um, with the, uh, with the, it, based on, on the changes that, from a, from a sedimentological point, relate to uh, changes in the, in the sequence stratigraphic framework. And then, um, because when you lock lethal fascias, sometimes it's like 10 centimeters, 15 centimeter, 20 centimeter interval, we actually want to use the, the high locker data in that interval. So we extracted the high locker data on the 10 centimeter interval and then merged it with the lithophases and facies association. And then that's also currently in process. And then look if we have, if you have a target horizon in, let's say, the, the bottom part of the Tepley, Tepley Hill, and you want to see what the carbonate content is of that relative to the other components, we can do that while, because it's been leveled against. Um, 
that horizon across all of the different drill holes. And I think we have around 50 or more drill holes that go through that, that, that package. Uh, so you can see from just those three examples that, so that's a composition, so those are carbonates versus uh, the, the quartz feldspar content plus the clays and micas, and you see that between the three drill holes, there is um, a shift in carbonate content on the base of that, so which might uh, be important for exploration targeting or not, but it sort of does kind of use of, of the, the data that we have all available in a, in a more, uh, in a different way. Another example is when you look at the, uh, the fuzzies that is relating to the glacial units. So you like the Valhalla sandstone, we wanna know, and I'll show you in a second why, what the, um, the relative calcite, con the calcite content is that. And you see there's quite a variation across all of these different drill holes. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you understand why, it just means there's a pattern. So the why is when you go into the micro scales, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, and thirdly, as I just said, we have this really nice sharp pattern across the different uh, mineralogy packages or the different stratigraphic packages. Uh, we then uh, use sort of automated multivariate boundary detection tools where it automatically, it goes through all of these uh, raw data profiles and then picks where there's a shop's boundary, but it takes all of the different mineralogy into account, basically what we see with visually with our eyes. And then I match them up with what we locked and you see it's, it's picking up really well. So it's a way of, if you don't know yet what you're going through when you, or you haven't got an experienced, experienced geologist in the street or shelf, you could use that to quickly pick your boundaries without having to lock the core. You have to high lock it, of course, but, so it's, it's just another way of, of or you go through um, the uh, holes that have, have, might have mismatches so it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of testing if the, the drill logs provided uh, are consistent with what's been submitted or you know, what's been high logged. And then lastly, as I said, we're gonna go into the micro scale. So of course, um, with the data collection, we collected PXRF data and that's only on four meter intervals. So it's not very, it looks quite dense because it's a long drill hole. Uh, but you see there is a bit of a copper spike in the top of the Viala sandstone and a bit of arsenic as well. So we thought, I'll uh, have a look, because we were going to do, are we doing the diagenesis of the basin, which helps us to see what the, the burial history was as well. I don't have much time to get into detail for that one. But what you see in that is like, you see this pretty boring looking sandstone here, but then something happened because that interval here looks a bit leached. It's got like some bit of dark raining looking kind of things. And then we've got the sample, so that's the thin section of it. And you see this, all of the white stuff is the quartz, the transmitted light, but you see those sort of black, black areas and you see like a bit of a, almost like a front of black stuff, which is right here. So if we zoom into further into that, and that will be my, my last slide. Um, so based on 20 thin sections we looked at throughout the base, mainly on, on, on sandstones because they're easier to, to um, understand and where you find grain shales. But basically what we know already from uh, looking at the different ones we usually have, and that's a very normal thing, um, you know, you've got a quartz rich sandstone with a lot of K feldspar, and one of the first things that happened is K feldspar dissolution and you form cement, so that's like a low temperature thing. Low, I mean uh, between uh, 50, 60 degrees. Uh, and then you start forming ferrone dolomites, and then you might also have um, quartz, where well, you got quartz cement and ferrone dolomite. And then so when ferrone dolomite and quartz cement kick in in a normal basin fluid, it's you looking at around 800 uh, degrees um, or 90 degrees, those three kilometers depth. So we kind of can estimate roughly how much the rock must have been buried, even if it's currently at, you know, 400. And then afterwards, so that's like your normal basin subsidence, your basin evolution but then something else happened. And you show the, the slides over here. So we looked at what I just explained. So we got the quartz, we got the quartz cement. Uh, and then, but then we have filling those pores over the top of the quartz cement, we have copper sulfides. So that would tell you the copper sulfides actually formed after the burial. And um, which you think, okay, it could still happen at depth if the pores were open. 
But then we also have calcite cements with it, and the calcite is non-ferrone, so there is, it's not normal to have non-ferrone carbonates at depth uh, if the fluids were purely coming out of the pore fluid in that rock. So something else must have happened um, to bring in a, an exotic or extrinsic fluid into the system that forms calcite, and then the sulfides actually replacing the calcite. So from a, from a diagenetic point, you would have your normal burial, and then something else happens, and you're forming a calcite sulfide, uh, copper sulfides, is in this case energite, and then they've been um, dissolved again into arsenides over printing. And so if that's related to uh, surface waters, or if it's related to um, some deeper fluids that come through that have a different composition than the normal pore fluid, we don't know. But it's likely both of that would have happened through a basin inversion event. And we found it in the top of the Viala, but we also found it in other stratigraphic units. It's not, in this case, it's sort of not, you know, not economic, but it tells us that the uh, copper sulfides in the Stuart shell, from what we've seen, that sit within, associated with sandstones, they are likely to be a late event post, post burial, like what I'm post burial timing wise. So we do have evidence, could be related to the Delamarian, could be related to another event that, you know, where you get the trigger event that, that gets the, the fluid circulating around in the basin. And that's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you.